How's that? Great. <laughs> God, I hate that when that happens, don't you? Yeah. Are we all good? Yep. Let's go. All right. So if you have questions, like Elise said, please pop them in the chat box. We'll be taking time as we go along. And today we'd like to, I'd like to help focus in on some expanded information about the trauma response. I love what we've been doing in terms of understanding trauma in victims and survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence and all kinds of um, violence. But I think it's time for an update and I'm gonna bring in some pieces that may help us to look at where do we need to like build on what we already know. We'll look at some of the physical health issues of victims and survivors that we're now learning about, the new mental health challenges for those people and the importance of sleep, which we're not even talking about yet. I'm bringing this up because I want you to think about some of the many issues and concerns that we all see, right? Whether it's the low rate of people who report, well, why is that? And what can we do about that? Or the dropout rate of people who, after they file a police report, or any of those other issues, our delayed ability to process sexual assault kits and low prosecution rates, and the long-term impact of sexual assault. And this thing, this thing about re-victimization, what's fueling that and how might we reduce that? We've all done some really good work so far in sexual assault response. And one of my favorite pieces is understanding implicit bias, right? Now this is a pretty weird picture. I gotta tell you, I understand. But it's so important to take a look at because implicit bias is how your mind gets organized and how it takes in information and applies meaning to it. And I was down in Florida for a conference and I was looking for walking around looking for a restaurant where I could eat. And I happened upon this. I'm not kidding you. It was a big red Volkswagen with a giant lobster on it. And I've been working so intensely in sexual assault. I mean, just day and night focused in on sexual assault that the first thought that popped into my head when I saw this was not, boy, this must be a great seafood restaurant. My first thought was, does he have permission for that? You know, I like went to consent and all kinds of things. And then I went, wait a minute, how do I know it's a he? How do I know? You know? I mean, it was crazy, but then it made me stop and think, right? How when we're so absorbed in the issues, sometimes we see things through our own lens. So let's build on those good pieces like our work in implicit bias. And let's think, are we missing important pieces? The Sexual Assault Kit Initiative is um, rolling out some fabulous, fabulous understandings on how we work with cases that move forward through prosecution, right? And the one thing that I found that was really interesting is a report out of Cuyahoga County, Ohio, right? When they were looking at um, their process, right, for um, testing and, and addressing their backlog of sexual assault kits, they looked at 243 cases. And here's what they found. After an, an incident, right, after an incident, eight, in 88% of the cases, right, there were no issues by the police regarding credibility. The police believed that the victim, right, who was filing the report had a legitimate, you know, event happen to her and or him, right? And they weren't questioning whether or not this person was believable. But in in 96% of those folks um, did take those first steps to cooperate with pl police and file um, a police report. But most of them, 69%, did not respond to further contacts by police. They dropped off the face of the earth. They stopped contact. And it wasn't because, like, you know, a lot of our work's been based on um, how do we help police believe victims so that they'll file and move forward? These were people who were believed and still 
dropped off contact. So when I see things like that, and the same thing was happening in several other cities, same pattern, um, I begin to wonder if we're not missing something in our response to sexual assault. So let's look at those missing, what those missing pieces may be about. A lot of us have already had training in the fight, flight, and freeze response. Yay. You know, I was at DOJ and in the audience when Rebecca Campbell first spoke to the um, Department of Justice on this very topic, right? And we've since expanded it to even include understanding collapse or tonic immobility. But we haven't so much included a discussion about hyperfocus or tunnel vision, dissociation, attempts to appease the offender, or shame and guilt-based responses. So I'm gonna touch on those a little bit, see what you think. We understand tonic immobility, right? Most of you have had training, right? Good. And we understand that that's an involuntary state of paralysis in response to perceived inescapability to extreme danger. The body shuts down. And if you go online and look around, for images of tonic immobility, you see sharks doing this, right? Floating in states of tonic immobility when they perceive danger. So it's a response that we know happens across um, species. And as we begin to look at it and understand it, when we hear that people have experienced this with a sexual assault, we should know and understand too that it's highly associated with the likelihood that they have and will develop severe PTSD symptoms, anxiety, and may exhibit disassociation. So tonic immobility, understanding it and seeing it, lets us understand a little bit more about the people involved. Um, it seems like an easy concept, right? Right? And when we hear victims and survivors talk about their experience, what happened when this happened to them, we get it. But it doesn't always, um, it doesn't, service providers don't always get it the first time around. Um, I started teaching this to law enforcement and they just went tonic immobility. Yeah, right. You know, they kind of just got into this disbelief state until a sheriff what was in a domestic violence assault, was severely um, injured by her partner, um, ended up with um, problems with vision and multiple physical um, disabilities. Um, but she went into a state of taunt. She um, was strangled. She went into unconsciousness. And the person stopped assaulting her, thinking she was already dead. When she came to in consciousness, she experienced tonic immobility, right? And in her recovery, she developed severe PTSD and needed a lot of help. And it was then when law enforcement could see that this could happen to persons who are trained to protect themselves, who have weapons, who are strong individuals, that it can be this severe and debilitating. That's when they got it. So. Tonic and mobility, I know we're talking about it, but be careful in terms of are people really getting what it means. The thing we're not talking about as much is hyper-focus. And Jim Hopper, I know you've had him in other trainings. He knows lots about this, so I put a little link there for you. But hyper-focus is often referred to as tunnel vision. Law enforcement experience this. They call it tunnel vision, right? There's even a police chief in Dayton, Ohio, right, who's on a mic so that if his officers go into tunnel vision, he um, walks them through it because they may be in an incident that's really provoking fear and at an unconscious, right, an unconscious, not thought through kind of way just happens. Um, and during that time, right, they're only... Uh, able to take in central details that are important, things that are important to their survival, and they're not paying attention, not taking in information about peripheral details. And that's an important concept to understand as well. 
Now, I didn't get the central and peripheral details very easily either until, well, a brand new Nissan Pathfinder. I, I rented it to go to a wedding with my daughter on the drive home. We were driving this big, beautiful new vehicle. Uh, a wheel came off a vehicle coming from the other direction. It cut across the lanes of traffic and um, bounced into our vision and our lane and took out a wedge-shaped piece of the front engine. I could feel myself go into tunnel vision, right? I could feel myself concentrate on keeping my daughter who was driving the vehicle calm, trying to maintain control of the vehicle, speaking slowly, assisting my daughter in getting that vehicle off the road so that we would safe and we wouldn't hit anyone else. And that's all I was focused in on. And the world seemed to slow down, right? And that's the feeling of hyper-focus. And later, when the state police responded, we were standing by the road with a badly damaged vehicle. And the officer said to me, he goes, so where did that wheel go? <laughs> I just went, I don't know. because. Where the wheel traveled after hitting us was a peripheral detail. It didn't come into my consciousness. It wasn't part of my memory. But the officer looked at me like, how could you not remember that, right? It was because I was experiencing a state of tunnel vision or hyper focus, right? And so can we also talk to, as we're working with people who have been assaulted, can we ask them what they experienced? If they're describing something that looks like this, they may have been in, under such a state of threat that they went into tunnel vision or hyperfocus, right? They may not have imprinted or taken on some of the details that we may need as we move forward to prosecute a case or do an investigation. So also in that, that same auto accident. Boy, isn't it weird how odd things can teach you stuff? Um, I, like many victims of a trauma, traumatic event, right, uh, experienced a rush of stress hormones that just flood your body. And there's all kinds of controversy about exactly which hormone it is. I'm not going to go there. I know that we have that rush of stress hormones that flood our body and they go into all of our major organs to help us survive, right? And in that accident, right, I didn't feel particularly the rush of stress hormones. But two days later, I felt extreme fatigue, extreme fatigue. And my daughter, who was the driver of the car, right, who was living in a nearby city, also experienced but extreme fatigue that very same afternoon. And both of us had to go home immediately and go to bed. What in the world happened? Are our bodies experiencing some kind of extreme fatigue after such an intense rush of stress hormones? Is this part of what's happening to sexual assault victims? We probably hear and see it more often in domestic violence survivors. How many, um, how many of you and how many people working in shelters, right, get someone who's been in extreme danger and they don't want to take that call when the police officer calls. They don't want to think about anything. In fact, they often tell us they just want to climb into bed and pull up the covers. Are they experiencing the extreme fatigue that's the aftermath of being under such stress? I would hope this, this is one of the things that we could look, look at as we try to improve our response to sexual assault, because think about it. When we, after, if we see someone who's just been assaulted, they may have gone through a forensic exam, right? And then, we give them to, they may have met briefly with law enforcement, but we wait two sleep cycles to um, do a more intensive investigation or follow up with them. 
is our follow-up lining up exactly with their recovery from stress hormones? Are they experiencing the same kind of fatigue that I felt and my daughter felt? It's a piece of that trauma response that we aren't really looking at. And maybe it's the reason why we have such a high dropout rate of even credible victims and survivors after initial contact. Okay, so here's some of the questions. And I hope that we're talking about tunnel vision. The other reason why I hope it does is because it, it affects service providers as well as um, victims and, and victims of sexual assault. So if our service providers are experiencing tunnel vision, how do we help and support them? The other thing we don't often talk about is dissociation, right? Dissociation often develops when people are in situations that are so dangerous or so difficult that their mind just shuts down. Um, and what it looks like is a blank stare. It's a survival response that looks like a blank stare. I see it in my family of origin whenever I talk about my dad with certain family members. They go into this blank stare just for maybe a few seconds. And it's like they can't hear me and they can't respond, right? I would bet that if you knew what dissociation looked like, that you would begin to recognize that it's happening a lot in the people that you're working with as well. One of the best people to teach us about dissociation is Olga Trujillo. Do you guys know her? I hope so. I've been following Olga for years. Um, Olga has dissociative identity disorder. She developed it as a child in response to some pretty severe abuse. And now she's speaking publicly so that we understand how dissociation, that shutting down, is just a survival response. And Olga's no uh, wimp about anything. Olga is an attorney by training. And she served as general counsel for the Office of Victims of Crime, Department of Justice, while also having dissociative identity disorder. So there's a lot of people who are high functioning and out there in the world, and certain things will trigger this response. If you want to see more about it, I've given you the link. Olga Trujillo has her own website now, right? Yes, right? And she has a couple of books out and some um, video segments. But she just has such a touching and human way of helping us understand dissociation, right? Not to be scared of it, not to be worried about it, um, to understand that people do this to protect themselves. And if you watch her videos, Olga also talks about this whole dynamic involved in diso in uh, revictimization. We know in studying the brain that parts of the brain uh, that that when you're faced with what you perceive as threat, you shut down the operation of the prefrontal cortex, and your more primitive parts of your brain will kick in. So you're not able to reason and think things through. It doesn't even go through those thoughts and events and what's happening in the moment doesn't go through those channels. So you respond, right, in a way that doesn't protect you. And Olga talks about this too. She talks about a time when, as a young woman, she was on a bus and a kind of skanky guy was looking at her and giving her that weird look. and. And um, he started getting too close. And, you know, at this point, most of us would pull away, right? Or do something to protect ourselves. But Olga went into this kind of numb state. And she went with the man and he raped her. And she didn't feel capable, right, of protecting herself and acting differently in that moment. 
And that's that pattern, that brain pattern that's set in place by especially re people experiencing repeat victimization, violence, and abuse, right? So how do we interrupt that, right? But if you don't know what it is and you've always wondered, Olga will give you lots and lots of insights. If you have someone in your office who just suddenly goes into a blank stare and isn't answering you, right? And they may be dissociating, they may just be checked out for a few minutes. The National Institute on the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine just did a great webinar. And these are the kinds of things they recommended that we do and don't do for that person. They noted, do not touch the person. You know how we want to run in there in comfort? Do not touch the person who's blanked out, right? And don't rush. Pause. Start to talk slowly and in a soft tone of voice. Ask the person if they can shake down their head yes or no, right? So that you can begin communicating a little if possible. The person may not respond. Ask if they're feeling a lot of fear. If they're feeling fear, they may be stuck in a frozen response. But if they're not feeling fear and just blank, that's dissociation. You can slowly, slowly, slowly introduce small movements. Ask them if they can hear your voice. Can they look to the right or the left? Can they move a small finger? or foot? Can they describe to you three things they see in your room? And it will help you to connect with them if you can breathe together with a slow exhale. And that circular breathing, oh, we'll talk about circular breathing in day two, but five breaths in, five counts in of breathing, inhale, five counts out with no pause in between, and I'll tell you why, right? You can ask the person who's stuck in that thing about, are you feeling more present now as they start to come back? And you can talk about what happened as a survival response with them. Because a lot of people are pretty embarrassed and ashamed that this happened and that you saw it, that they're out of control, right? Um, and you can notice what it was that was said or done, what happened, just before the person kind of blanked out. Gives you some understanding of how to work with them well. But too many of us don't even know how to identify dissociation. We don't have these simple guidelines about how to respond. And that information isn't integrated into our policies and practice. Because when you see dissociation, somebody needs help. Somebody really needs help. And you need mental health people who understand dissociation, particularly among people with histories of trauma. Do, and do we even have those kinds of resources in our communities? Right. I love where mental health is going these days. For the only the last two or three years, the whole field of mental health has come to understand trauma so much better. Hopefully your mental health providers are too, because there are some people in the field, top national trainers who are saying, do not diagnose someone or a condition until you treat the trauma. There are trauma oriented practices that are fixing, right? Curing what we thought were unfixable things like, um, uh, borderline personality disorder. If you're a therapist, you don't want these clients because you don't think they're fixable. But trauma, effective trauma-informed therapies helping them. And in Fairfax County, where I was hanging out for a while in Virginia, they're doing it in, in mental health. And in two years, they're seeing people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder resolve layers and layers of trauma and be undiagnosable at the end of two years. Oh my God, can you imagine? Can you even imagine? The head, one of the best persons, Saburn Fisher, in neurofeedback with children and adolescents, 
she absolutely says, don't even diagnose attention deficit disorder. Don't diagnose problems until you treat trauma. And I love that because I think that's going to help us um, address our mental health issues more effectively. And, look, and I'll show you what kinds of issues are popping up. Um, the other thing we're not talking about is shame, right? How do we ever, ever even have this word in trauma-involved trainings? And again, I've given you the National Institute for the Clinical Application of Behavioral Medicine. They give you some um, important insights into people who have experienced trauma and now have intense shame. Because you know what? These are the clients who are most likely to just flare up at us, right? They want to get close and then they just flare up at us. And <laughs> I don't know about you, but if your team doesn't understand that sometimes victims and survivors get triggered and that they come at us with an angry, overly, overly done response, they're likely to come at us and say, what'd you do? What'd you do to them to set them off? And maybe you didn't do the best thing, but the person's response is a reflection of, too, how they're coping and what they need, right? So we need to understand the responses of folks so we don't blame each other, right? And that we can really assess what we're doing. Is it good or bad? Does it need to be changed? Or is this part of what the person needs, right? And we're just not providing. We're not understanding. So if you get someone like this, some of the things that you can remember and think about, remember that they're afraid of being seen and known. And a too nice person will scare them. Scare them to death. It's like they want a relationship with you, but they're scared, right? So a neutral approach often works a little better. And just simple things like sitting at a 90 degree angle and not directly face to face takes that edge off as well. And breathing with someone whom we wish to help calm and ground. Don't ask them to breathe. Don't tell them to do it. And then watch them. Because when you are watched, how do you feel? Right? If you're dealing with intense kinds of emotions and someone's watching you breathe, it's uncomfortable. But if you breathe with them, they can begin to calm and ground, and you can establish a connection with them in a nonverbal kinds of way. And you can also talk about how difficult it might be for the person to pick up your phone when you call next, right? To show up for the next meeting, anticipate that it's going to be difficult, right? And say, if you can't come, give them some options. If you can't come to our next meeting, now we're on Zoom, but if you can't come, would you at least let me know you're okay? Right? Would you look with me at a different time or day when it might be better for you? Right? Leave the door open a little bit with folks. So those are the pieces I think we need to add in terms of that. Any questions so far? Yes, we have two questions. Let's take them. All right. So one question we had was around disassociation. And so we still want to ask, can you discuss disassociation years after? I'm working with someone who uh, lo loses moments and memories, doesn't have any me memory of going to buy something and then finds it in their closet is one example. Yeah. Exactly. And that can be lots of things, but it can be dissociation. And you'll and the person who's dissociating while they're blanked out, they do not have any memory of what's going on. Um, but what you need and what, what you see when you um, when someone's having that kind of behavior is how do you get them connected with a mental health professional who can assess that, who can help figure out what that is exactly and how to intervene. It's a big red flag. And, and I don't um, expect that anyone on this call, unless you're a therapist, is going to be a therapist, right? I just love to take that clinical information and teach people who are front and center with folks in how to best use it. And so for the dissociation, if you're noticing that behavior, 
if people are describing that behavior, right? Um, tell them you need some help in trying to figure it out. And contact a mental health um, person who can join you in a session, right? Who can make a, a warm handoff and get started on figuring that out. Great. And then we have another question that says, in your opinion, would it be beneficial for us as advocates to wait more than 48 hours to reach out to survivors when they request a follow-up after an assault? Well, we're going to get into that whole controversy around that 48-hour break mm -hmm. right next. Oh, great. And then That's there's my absolutely next slide. And there's a follow-up to the dissociation question. Um, Louisa says, she, I am a M MFT, and I just started seeing the client. Um, I really like, um, if I get situations with folks that I don't understand and I'm doing clinical work, I get a consultation. So if you have people who are particularly good at working with um, dissociation, uh, ask if you can do a contact or consult regarding your case. And look for the, the um, training that's available at NICAM, N-I-C-A-B-M really some of the best, most practical um, ways of joining with someone who's dissociating, um, walking them through, the, being with them during that time, and then working it out in a, in a way that helps them understand that, anticipates it coming, right? Sees it as survival. Doesn't lay another layer of guilt and blame and shame. So I, I, I found their training and their information's a lot online, of course, right now. Um, so it's even more accessible. Um, I really like Pat Ogden's work, O-G-D-E-N, Ruth Lanius' work, L-A-N-I-U-S. They're both with um, uh, NICAM and on those webinars. Really practical, down-to-earth guidance for you. Great, that's all our questions we have so far. Okay, so let's go on to that next question. Look at this. <laughs> that practice, remember, as we as we get started in working and understanding trauma, uh, many of us adopted a practice uh, from a law enforcement perspective, especially, of allowing a person, right, after a traumatic event, to have at least two sleep cycles before an intensive interview. Well, we did that because we understand that during sleep, right, we integrate memory. We take memory from our short-term file and we put it in a long-term file. But as I talked to Jim Hopper about this, and he and I had lots of conversations about sleep and memory and this practice in particular. He was saying that from a law enforcement perspective, if we have some interview, right, and we go over some of the major points of what happened, that the person during sleep afterwards will be better able to access those memories and integrate them into long term memory. So they aren't lost, they aren't forgotten, and the person can access them as we go into a more intensive interview. From an advocate's point of view, I don't know that this makes any sense because if you're an advocate, you've worked with these folks, how many people go home and have a good night's sleep after being assaulted? Or after a, a forensic interview? or after filing a police report, right? If you work on the hotlines, you know that people are calling. When do they call the most often? At dusk, when it starts to get dark, when they are trying to ease into going to sleep. So this assumption that they're getting two sleep cycles in is one I'd like us to take a look at. The person I like on this topic a bunch is Matthew Walker. He's a PhD, a professor of neuroscience and psychology at UC Berkeley and director of its sleep and neuroimaging lab. He's a former professor of psychiatry at Harvard. So he knows his stuff and his information is science-based, but easy and effective to read. 
So if you don't pick up anything else for your own health, for the health of your family, and for our work with victims and survivors, pick up why we sleep. Um, Matthew Walker shows us uh, the science behind what sleep does for us, not only in integrating those memories, right, but in repairing our body, in cleaning out debris in our brain, right, in keeping us healthy, in resetting our immune system, just every single body that we have. But most people, including the people before they got assaulted, right, are operating in kind of a sleep bankruptcy. I mean, how many of you are sleeping well now, right? With the pandemic and concerns about the economy and loss of jobs and maybe the death or loss of people you love, right? We are all experiencing incredible disruptions to sleep. And we need about seven to nine hours every night so that we can, the body can heal itself, the immune system can reset, and we can do memory consolidation. And, and if you look at the surveys and as I talk to people, one of the biggest, most common complaints of sexual assault survivors is that they have trouble sleeping, right? So if we're giving them two sleep cycles, assuming that they sleep, what if they aren't? Would it be helpful for advocates to call during that time and check in and see how they're doing? Let's take just a minute to look at two small concepts, because it also affects us as workers, right, and responders, to look at the impact, the power of not getting what happens when you don't get enough sleep and when we disrupt our circadian rhythm, our time of natural wakefulness and sleepiness. I pulled this right out of Matthew Walker's book, right? But even, listen to this. If you open up the first page, I swear, first page of chapter one, routinely sleeping less than six or seven hours a night demolishes your immune system more than doubling your risk of cancer. We now know that it's associated particularly with bowel, breast, and prostate cancers. Insufficient sleep is the key lifestyle factor determining whether or not you will develop Alzheimer's. An inadequate sleep, even moderate reductions for just one week, disrupts blood sugar levels so profoundly that you would be classified as pre-diabetic. You gotta read this book, folks, okay? You gotta read this book. So the fact that survivors, victims and survivors may not be getting enough sleep, all right, either in the total number of hours or waking during the night, so they're interrupting these natural cycles, is going to have a profound effect on all psychological disorders, all psychological states, anxiety, depression, and PTSD, right? As well as these physical ones that I pulled out here, right? Pulling one all-nighter results in a 40% decrease in the ability to learn and integrate memory. They looked at this with college students, right? How many of our victims and survivors are missing a night's sleep? Right? Does that two-night Two sleep cycle policy makes sense if people are not sleeping, right? Um, the immediate impact on the immune system, oh my gosh, less than seven hours sleep, three times higher risk of catching rhinovirus. That's really important right now, right? Five hours or less in a night, a 70% increased risk for pneumonia. And sleeping four hours or less for just one night resulting in a 70% drop in our killer cells in the immune system, our frontline protection against disease. And here's what I'm just going to throw in there. It's not necessarily relevant, but they've looked at circadian rhythms and also disrupted sleep to notice that poor sleep the week before a vaccine can result in 50% less of an antibody response in your body. So if we're all getting vaccines, what's the lesson here? We all need to get some sleep, 
before. Um, so it's just an issue that I don't think we're asking um, victims and survivors about at all. If we look at circadian rhythms, and there's some really good stuff out there, if you want a source, I'll send you one. But think night owls and early birds. How many of you are night owls? <laughs> I used to be one before I had a baby and she was an early bird. So I became an early bird. <laughs> right? I no longer can sleep in. Um, I love my daughter, but dang, she just woke up at dawn every day um, and helped me reset my circadian rhythm. So that time of natural right, um, wakefulness and sleep. This is important because as particularly at the end of the day, we're looking at moving into a time when our body goes into restorative sleep. Right, where we start, our body does its physical healing and repair. They're finding that they can um, time uh, cancer treatment according to circadian rhythm so that the, it's available for the body to use as it moves into this natural time of healing. Right? Are we using that circadian rhythm at all in our practice? Here's one way we might. Unfortunately, in a new 2020 report, the World Health Organization, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, pulled together a working group of 27 scientists from 16 states to look at all the studies on the carcinogenic, how carcinogenic night shift work is. And they deemed that it's probably carcinogenic to humans because it disrupts the body's ability to go through natural sleep cycles and heal itself and strengthen its immune system. They looked at uh, many of us, right, are providing around the clock services, right? And this is a concern. The only reason why it wasn't a higher level of proof Right? It didn't move into, yes, it causes. It's probably carcinogenic. The reason why it's at a group 2A is that the studies involving humans were often mm, very differently structured, didn't always measure the same thing, didn't have um, huge sample sizes. Right, There was good information, but it wasn't solid enough to move it into group 1. The information and what they saw in studying animals Right. Animal studies was extremely strong, showing that not only did um, disruptive or lack of sleep cause cancer in animals, but it resulted in death just as soon as, as much as restricting them from food. So what do we do with this? Because we've all got to we've all got to work shifts sometimes, right? Let's think. Let's think, we can't not always have shift workers, but, right, is there a way for like our hotlines to be answered by someone in another time zone and call us if it's an emergency, right? Is there a way that we can have those early birds, right, on an even earlier shift, because they don't mind getting up at 4.30, 5 o'clock, right? And can we have our night owls, people who, who just naturally stay up at night, can we have them cover shifts that need so that staying awake at night isn't as disruptive? And that's the recommendation from Dr. Walker, Matthew Walker, and how we might work with this. Um, it's also important to know, particularly if we're working with um, teenagers, <laughs> if we're working with teenagers, right? or we're working with people and we want to know if they're night owls or early birds, it will help us pick times when we can follow up and they're going to be alert and, and able to work with us or set that next appointment or follow up phone call. So questions? No questions here. Okay. Let's move into this one because this was brand new stuff to me and you should see what's coming out. 
uh, new studies are coming out regarding the physical health of victims and survivors. Julie Valentine, many of you have probably um, seen her at conferences, Brigham Young University College of Nursing, and a fabulous PhD level um, sexual assault nurse examiner. They have some of the biggest databases. She's also working with um, Texas A&M, right? To, to look at databases of as many as 6,000 people at a time. Wow. To see what six to see what kinds of information that we can glean. And in one study, and I gave you the link here, they looked at sexual assault victims who were seeking a forensic exam from 2010 to 2014. They looked at over 2,300 patient records, right? And look at what they found. Oh my God. Nearly 70% had a previous sexual assault. Ah, that hurts my heart. They had two to three times the rate of mental illness and use of psychotropic drugs. 60% had a current medical problem and 48%, nearly three times their state rate of the general population had a chronic medical problem. Now think, if you already have an existing mental illness, right? If you already have an existing medical issue and you're sexually assaulted, what's going to happen to your body? What's going to happen to your emotional state? Right? How do we need to respond? A sad study, but really well done, was um, completed in 2018, commissioned by Chris Rose at OVC and published. And the author did a fabulous meta-analysis looking at cancer, right? in uh, particularly intimate partner violence, so both domestic violence and sexual assault. And sadly, she found that 60%, 69% were more likely to be diagnosed with cancer compared to women who were not victims. Jeez. 154% more likely to be diagnosed with cervical cancer. And this might also be influenced by the HPV virus, which also prompts um, cervical cancer. But the sad part was that there were no differences in the women in screening patterns. They all went to the doctor as much. They all got screened. But victims of IPV had much, much higher rates. So questions to consider. Like I said, how are those medical issues exacerbated by someone who's experiencing another sexual assault or their first, right? How does that make it difficult for a victim or survivor to seek or use services? Right. And oh, could we consider having an integrated healthcare response for sexual assault? Yay, right? Integrated healthcare is being used with seriously mentally ill populations. And we have a whole body of information in SAMHSA about how to set it up and make it work for that population, many of whom are probably our clients as well, right? And there are people testing it out. Jenny Black's doing it in Austin, Texas at SAFE, right? Where they see both domestic violence and sexual assault folks, and they needed to address the physical illnesses, right? And what was happening both as a result of the assault and what people were just struggling with in terms of their overall health care so that they could move, um, they could help people recover. I'm so glad they started this in mental health because I thought it was crazy to be seeing seriously mentally ill people, putting them on lots of meds and not being concerned about their diabetes, right? Their blood sugar levels, their thyroid levels, or even their diet made no sense to me. So do we need to do the same kinds of things if we're going to improve our sexual assault response? The mental health of victims and survivors. Can we go there? Ready? Okay. 
the mental health of victims and survivors is giving us tons of new insights into how people are doing both when they come in the door, right, when we first meet them, and over time. Uh, if you haven't heard of the Better Tomorrow Network, at least grab these people. They are turning out some of the best research. You probably have seen them at conferences, um, but they're a strong team at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, their Institute for Trauma Recovery, and they have organized a network of 12 sexual assault um, centers across the United States. They have both a women's health study where they hope to recruit as many as 750 people and study how they're doing over time. And they're putting in place an adolescent study, yay, as of like 2019. Yeah. So they can look at the immediate and long-term impacts of sexual assault and their population that they're looking at is racially diverse, culturally and racially diverse, yay. So they've got a good balance, right, of all kinds of diverse people. Um, however, they are just focusing on females in terms of gender at this time. I gave you the link for some of their studies, but let's look at a couple of things that they found lately. The study on the uh, left of the screen is probably no surprise to any of you. If a person experienced strangulation during sexual assault, it pretty much um, predicted that they'd have more severe PTSD symptoms, right? <gasps> right? And that's about, and, uh, and they checked it six weeks after the assault. So it continues to be a strong reason for us to ask about strangulation and ask several times because people don't always recall when we ask them the first time. But when they looked at people six weeks later and asked about other things, when they looked at 254 patients, look what they found. 61% with moderate to severe depression, 82% with PTS symptoms. And this is the interesting part, 43% reporting worsening physical pain, right? Physical pain isn't something that we're tracking very much in people. But if you're feeling worse, worsening physical pain, how likely are you to respond to a phone call or a follow-up meeting? If you're also experiencing moderate to severe depression, how difficult is it for you to get it together and take that next step, right? So this is important information for us to know. It's important for our screening, our initial contacts, and our follow-up um, involvement. The latest one just came out in 2020. And they were able to look at 151 people and ask them six months after sexual assault, how are they feeling? And look what they continue to find six months later. These are still very high rates of moderate to severe PTS, moderately severe depression, high levels of anxiety, and clinically significant new or worsening pain. And we still expect people to come and see us. Okay, this is concerning. They're gonna be checking and seeing um, kind of what happens in a longitudinal study for these folks. But so far they're able to report out as to six months later. One of my favorite meta-analyses looks even further down the road and looks at even more. In fact, they looked at 497 studies over, what, 40 years, 45 years. Dwork and Menon, Burstinsky and Allen, right? And there's the title for you. And they looked at sexual assault victimization and mental health studies that were done during that time and um, standardized databases that involved over 238,000 people. That's a lot of folks. They looked at different types of sexual assaults, both forced, penetrative, penetrative, coerced, right, where they're um, verbally pressured, incapacitated. I love that they include this, because look what they find. On any unwanted sexual contact, 
They did not look at threats or attempts in depth. And some of the victims of adult sexual assault were also victimized as children. They weren't particularly excluded from this study. Um, they aren't particularly excluded in our populations, right? So here's what they found. In looking at all these studies, they were looking at how likely is it that a person who has experienced sexual assault will have more severe mental health symptoms than a person who has not. Dear Lord, look at this chart all along the board, including obsessive compulsive conditions, which are we training anybody in that, right? Suicidality, which we're starting to I know, do. I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to do work and take. Suicidality that we're starting to do um, some understanding and training in, but need to do more of. And anxiety, right? Anxiety is pretty high. And it's not included in a lot of training programs that I saw. They looked at the finding that that um, their, finding, their findings were is that there was evidence that experiencing sexual assault is a major risk factor for multiple forms of psychological dysfunction across population and assault types. And that the impact of sexual assault um, lasted for years. The average age of people in these studies was four to five years after the assault, and they were still reporting high impact, high mental health impact. There were uh, This, I thought, was an interesting thing that they also saw when they looked at lots and lots of research, was that the type of assault, whether it was forced, coerced, incapacitated, un unwanted sexual imp contact, did not affect the mental health impact on the person, on the victim. We often think that maybe people who are incapacitated, right, aren't going to have the same mental health impact because they weren't aware of what happened. This study says they are. Right? The only time, and the, the study even looked at the impact of attempted assaults, pretty high, not as high as completed assaults, but much, much higher than simple threats of assault. So how much do we train on suicide assessment, anxiety, OCD? How much do we? I don't know. So I'm going to stop here for questions. Anybody got any? We have a comment here. I believe that if they went even further back into participants' background, they would find that their ACEs could, could predict this as well. Yes, and... Um, the Uni University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Better Tomorrow Network has an article on that. So they're tying that in exactly. I think ACEs are uh, highly predictive. That's all the only question comment we have so far. Okay. So we have about 20 minutes, right? Yes. All right. So I'm going to um, move a little bit in terms of how well do we serve adolescents. One thing that I was very sad about as I looked at what services were being provided across the United States, number one, there's just a whole lack of sexual assault response in so many places I couldn't begin to tell you. I'll give you a little bit more numbers on it in day two. But it was rare, rare that I saw anyone who was really serving teenagers. The best that I saw was some prevention, early intervention work, but nobody really taking on the issue of how often adolescents may be sexually assaulted or commit sexual assault. This is particularly sad because 
in the United States, teenagers are going to continue to grow in the total number of our population. They are a huge chunk of folks. And if we're concerned about preventing or intervening with an initial assault, responding well to that first assault, helping them truly recover, interrupting patterns of re-victimization, addressing the physical and mental health impact of sexual assault. Why aren't we starting with teenagers? Some of our best prevention work though, I'll, I'll bring that one around because I do think prevention is equally as important, is in the CDC connecting the dots work. If you haven't been here, take a look, right? Because if you're trying to do work with teenagers and you're trying to go to high schools and say, I want to do this project or this program, what's the first thing that the school people tell us, right? They tell us things like, we're already doing that suicide prevention program or we're already doing that um, bullying prevention program. We don't have time to do more. Well, the CDC's Connecting the Dots program looked at the risk and protection factors for many different forms of violence. And they have it so that you can kind of like put in information and get more information for you, how you can find people doing it around the country. But in essence, you can look at if you want to prevent right sexual violence in a high school population, you can see the risk factors and the protective factors, particularly for the perpetration of that form of violence. And you can see how they're related to many other risk factors. It's like if we, if we address this one risk factor, we could reduce many forms of violence. It helps us integrate kind of our work across all these different forms of violence so that the schools don't feel in and over just overtaxed to respond to each particular topic. So if you're working with um, schools, they love, I've been showing them this and working with them on this. And we have some incredibly good information in the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and how to work with trauma in diverse kinds of youth, right? and their survivors, particularly offenders, people committing violence, friends and family members. And this body of information is growing. Um, in day two or next week, I'll particularly look at how they're doing this uh, in a cheap, quick way. You'll just be, I'm, I'm amazed at how easily we can make some headway in, with these folks. But, um, It brings up questions to consider, and I put these three in front of you, right? If we really want to intervene effectively, can we intervene more, intervene earlier? Can we do it better? And can we really look at a sexual assault response that's designed and implemented for teens? Okay. So I've got 12-12, which means I've got some time to just ask questions about anything I've seen across the United States. Or if you have something that you'd really like me to include in next day two, happy to do that as well. The chat is open, so if anybody wants to put anything in the chat. I've also put in the link for the evaluation for folks. Um, I'm just waiting to see if anything's pop up. Thank you so much for this so far, Joe. It is always so like revelatory, um, particularly the sleep piece. Oh so my God. Been, like when I heard you the first time talk about that, I think it's really important. And thinking about ways that we can better support survivors with sleep. Um, yeah, because look at the benefits to good sleep. And too often we're using medications. Yeah. And so, when Dr. Walker looked at sleep medications, right, and um, he had to stop his study 
because he looked at what was happening for their um, physical health two years in, and the rate of cancer was alarming. He had to, he couldn't ethically continue the study. Because wow. medication is a fine uh, one-time, short-term kind of intervention that helps many people, but too often we're using it in a long-term way and sleep medications do not allow our brain to go through its natural cycles of sleep. So we're missing time of healing, boosting our immune system and learning and integrating memory. So um, sleep medications, not more than a short-term fix and too many people are using them as long-term fix and there's better long-term fixes which we can talk about. Yeah, all right. I have a couple of questions. The questions are rolling in now. And so one folks asked, uh, someone asked uh, uh, if you could include for next week uh, more coping skills for PTSD, particularly for folks as they're waiting to get to like a clinical, longer term clinical support. Gotcha. So that's the part. Um, and someone asked, what can you restate the name of the book around um, sleep that you recommended? Yeah, it's called Why We Sleep. Yeah. Why We Sleep. And there's lots of good, if you're not a big reader, there's some good summaries of it in YouTube um, presentations by Dr. Walker that are about an hour long. So it gives you a little bit of depth, but the book is much better. Great. Right. Um, then we also have the question, if someone is so incapacitated that they cannot remember what happened, is the trauma still as significant? According to the meta analysis, yes. Yeah. And then incapacitated, um, incapacitated sexual assaults were just as damaging to people's mental health as pe as to folks who were alert. Well, and then we have another question from the director of our legal services team. And she said, when we are working with clients who are reporting to law enforcement and have experienced tonic immobility, uh, disassociation, um, et cetera, how do we as advocates or attorneys educate law enforcement about these things not being about about these things not being issues about credibility um that is a tough one because unless people have experienced or seen it they often don't believe it right um i brought in some of the top trainers on this subject i brought in as i was working with a multidisciplinary team and law enforcement just had trouble kind of getting their heads around it until their own sheriff was assaulted. And they saw tonic immobility. I mean, that woman came to alertness and, and her partner was wiping blood off her face because he'd called the ambulance thinking he'd strangled her to death, right? And she couldn't move, right? And so, she, but she could talk to her colleagues and let them know what had happened. Oh, no caller. Um, I, I think that when you find some compelling um, personal stories, like Olga Trujillo's tapes, I mean, you like what she experienced, she describes in such detail. And yet she keeps us um, human and she realizes that hearing this can be overwhelming. And she helps us understand dissociation like no one I've ever heard, no one. Um, and so I love her stuff for that. Um, tonic and mobility is just hard for people to get their heads around. Law enforcement are experiencing tunnel vision or hyperfocus. When they go on site, they may not be talking about it, but if you start putting it out there, um, and if you want the name of the Dayton chief of police, right, who talks his officers through tunnel vision responses, he's fabulous. I, I can get that information for you. That would be very helpful. And so um, someone else also said, uh, coping skills that we can offer until therapists can be found, simple methods would be very helpful. And then someone also commented, one thing that's been helpful to my clients with PTSD related hypervigilance that impacts sleep is fabric. Sleep, uh, sleep headbands with Bluetooth speakers, streaming white and pink noise seems to be especially helpful. Yes. And so that's why in session two, we'll look at easy applications of trauma recovery, response and recovery. What are some non-clinical things we can do to help people ease those symptoms, 
right? To feel some relief to cope until they can get um, someone to sit down with in a mental health setting. Yeah. And what are the better ways to promote good sleep? All right. I've got that all waiting for you folks. Um, I'll also be looking at some of our systems responses, if anybody has an interest in terms of rape crisis centers versus um, centers that serve multiple kinds of victims. Right? I'll be looking at federal data systems because the FBI changed the uniform crime report in 2017 in a significant way that impacts sexual assault data. And I'd like to add a small piece about the impact of the pandemic because I think it's going to create an additional group of people who are even more vulnerable to abuse and violence. The mental health um, reports are coming in that are looking at thousands of people across the world, right? And they're seeing things like sudden psychotic breaks in 30, 40, and 50 year olds where people need to be hospitalized, right? As well as that COVID fog as well as difficulty sleeping. And I think that we're gonna be recovering from the pandemic and we're gonna see people who are more open or more vulnerable to victimization. So I'd, yeah. like, to, um, I'd like to share with you the latest studies and, and just give you an idea of where to watch for as information comes out, because that's just, that, that's grown as we speak. Yes. Uh, we have a couple comments. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll make uh, available. I'll put that out all out in an email to participants for everybody. Also, some, someone um, commented that similarly, the elderly maybe we're seeing effects of COVID. And then there was a question on: Are there any studies or comments on the spiritual holistic practices on healing? I the closest I'm getting are some of the Buddhist approaches right that have been made more secular in terms of meditation focusing and mindfulness and um but the power of prayer and the power of spirituality is huge and now particularly as we see so many ex people experiencing the sudden death of someone they love i think it's going to come forward even more yeah and we also had a comment saying about the impact of COVID, children that are stuck at home with abusers. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want, I mean, I know where some of the Department of Ed stuff is on um, how to help people over the over Zoom, right? Assess and respond to child abuse. So there's more coming out to the Department of Ed on that because we realize that they're stuck at home with abusers. I agree. I'm very concerned too that um, as we see hospitals get overwhelmed and, and like in Los Angeles, they're having ambulance drivers who um, pick up someone who doesn't have much chance of recovering, not bring them to the hospital. Mm. Who's going to assess whether or not that was a violent death? Mm. And even I know that our coroners and different people should be in place, but they're equally overwhelmed. And I just saw a death certificate from someone, 46 year old man, daughter walked into his apartment, he's dead in his bed. And literally the death, the, the death certificate said, died in bed at home oh. as cause of death. I mean, I, I'm really concerned that people who wanna do harm can take advantage of our overwhelm and um, the chaos we're experiencing in systems to hurt someone and not get caught. No. Great. Are there any other questions, comments? I'm so bringing them back up. Um, I definitely you, think the piece that stood out to me um, all, as well was the piece around um, OCD uh, for mental health impact. And what I ever since I heard you speak about that really? before, I've been looking into it more and it makes sense around you know OCD, but never, uh, I hadn't really seen that incorporated as much as well. And a lot of people, when I, you say, I mean, you sound like you know what OCD is. A lot of people don't. Mm. And so if they're, you know, do they have the questions they need to just ask about it? 
You know, are you feeling anxious? Are you feeling worried? Right? Are you feeling scared to go out of the house? Right? Are there, is it hard for you to get things done? You just kind of like not, can't do it. Can't do it. Right? Or repetitive kinds of things that you do to kind of like try to feel safe. Like hand washing and locking the door 17 million times, right? All those kinds of things. Um, but just the ability to ask may help us get people to other folks who can help them. Absolutely. If we know that this could be a possible impact, are we just asking? How are you doing? You know, some people have a bumpy road. A lot of people do. How are you? And then shut up and listen. <laughs> right? Uh, one thing in assessment, a lot of people get stuck on, do I ask all the right questions? And there's certainly some right questions we can ask, but even more important is to let people know that you care and you wonder how they're doing and then get quiet and listen. Okay. Yeah, somebody also asked, can next time can we talk, uh, um, touch on um, disabled individuals? Mm. Uh, wow, disabled individuals. I did a whole, um, during my fellowship, I spent three years looking particularly at disabled um, victims of violence. And I can point you into some of the best that I've ever seen resources that were developed by people who were disabled on that committee. Um, it's not an area of expertise that I have, um, that I have, but, but just being with that group helped me understand the issues a whole lot more. So um, I will be happy to share with you who's doing that really, really good work. Yeah, because I got to hang out with all these people. I mean, I got to see what was happening in Maine and Georgia and Florida and you know, California and uh, Ohio, and it's really, really um, been quite a trip. And to do it, <laughs> to do it at this time, right after Me Too hit, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And administration's changed, quite interesting. So if you have any other questions or things that come up, you can always drop, Elise, can they drop you a line? Absolutely. And then I'll be happy to pull together um, the second session to really kind of look at what you need to know. Great. I put my um, email in the chat for any questions. If you have any follow up, please feel free to send me an email. Also, I put the link for the evaluation again. Thank you so much, Joe. I'm so excited for next week. Um, yes. I really learned so much. Yes. Well, we have a lot of work to do, but we have done some really good work and we're building on that. Great. So thank you. Thank yeah. you all Hope so much. to see you all again uh, next week. Great. All right. Take care, Joe. Thanks. Bye bye.